Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. This episode, we're joined by Sherry Wilson, the Nuts for Natives blog is yours, and you're also in real life Nuts for Natives, correct? That's right, Kathy. And the first time we met in person was last June, uh, a little over a year ago, in Denver, of all places, uh, for the Garden Bloggers Fling. Yes, and Kathy, that was uh, it was really a pleasure to meet you. And you know, I'm one of your biggest fans, and uh, we are so lucky here in the Washington D.C. metro area to be having someone like you providing all the information that you provide. And uh, you know, I will never forget. I asked you a quick question as we were sitting side by side on a bus tour of gardens. Um, I asked you a quick question about uh, mosquitoes, and you gave me an education. Uh, The depth of your knowledge was so impressive. And about 40 minutes later, I was thinking, wow, I should have brought a notepad because I'm going to learn a lot today. I could take a lot of notes here. So, yeah, but that was a really great time out in Denver. And uh, it's amazing what gardeners there can do in in those arid conditions. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, and and I think we'll circle back around towards the end of our conversation and talk about Denver versus D.C., but it's so funny to meet another local person in another um, growing zone and out of our normal comfort zone and be able to explore those gardens together and compare and contrast. Um, But let's talk about our local gardens first and how you got into natives and gardening yourself. Um, So we'll start way at the beginning. Are you a native to the D.C. area? Uh, No, I'm actually from South Florida and I moved uh, up here uh, to Baltimore, actually, to go to school. And I just immediately fell in love with the seasons here. And, you know, in Florida, there are seasons, but they're very subtle, unlike here where, you know, they're so pronounced. And uh, I found myself living in a 14 foot wide row home in Fells Point uh, in Baltimore, which many people know is the old maritime historic district there. And um, in the back of the row house, there was a a small plot and uh, it was filled with weeds. It was in the fall that I moved in and the weeds were waist high. And one day I just got out there and uh, uh, knew enough to know that those didn't look good. And I pulled those up and lo and behold, there was a very old brick patio in the back of this row house. And in the center of the brick patio was a four foot square. And um, I said to um, Uh, my now husband at the time, I said, well, I don't know what to do with this. And he said, well, let's go to Heckinger's to tell you how long ago it was. Heckinger's was still around. And it was November by this point. And there was this sad old looking uh, dogwood. The pot was cracked. You know, it was 75% off. So we bought it and we bought, uh, they also had a few packs of uh, iris bulbs. And so he told, he was a Baltimore native. He showed me how to plant those. I, you know, we planted them and I thought nothing more of it. And then one day, the following spring, I looked out there and both that dogwood, and it turns out it was the native dogwood at Cornus, Florida, uh, and the iris bulbs were blooming. And I was completely hooked on gardening from that moment forward. It was really a, a fun thing. Oh, what a wonderful success to start with. Yeah, yeah. Um, And, uh, you know, so I worked, uh, uh, I have, my career has been in the environmental field, um, mostly in Maryland. And so, uh, you know, from the early 90s on, there has been a movement with nonprofit organizations and with government agencies as well to promote native plants. So, uh, you know, you always want to be the change you want to see. So I've always tried to use native plants as as much as possible. And, um, you know, fast forward, I am sort of nutsy about them. 
and uh, that prompted me to start the blog. And and really because, uh, you know, people like yourself who are so knowledgeable, you you know, you'll do the research. You'll you're going to read reports and trials of plants and so forth. But I know a lot of people who they're not avid gardeners, but they care about their garden. And uh, they understand that uh, the premise behind native plants and how it's beneficial. Um, but, but they're just going to go to their local garden center and, and get plants, you know, for the half day on a weekend when they have time to do some garden. You know, they're not going to research it. So I'm really just trying to make it a little bit easier for someone who doesn't want to, um, you know, spend all their free time like I would uh, reading about native plants. So that, that's sort of how I got started. Yeah, it can be a bit of a learning curve and, and somewhat daunting um, to ta- tackle the whole subject of native gardening. Yes, I think so. And, and so, um, you know, I always say don't let perfect be the enemy of, of good and, and you've got to start somewhere. So I'm really just trying to make it easier for people to start. And um, I think native plants are having a moment um, as is gardening uh, in this odd season we find ourselves in. And uh, so it, it's a good time to be talking about native plants, I think. And I think a lot of gardeners, even beginning gardeners who might walk around their yard might be surprised at how many natives they already do have incorporated in that they just don't know about. I think you're right. And there are a lot of native plants that are really common here. Uh, we talked about the dogwood, uh, the coneflowers, butterfly weed, black-eyed Susans, uh, you know, the service berries, I think are fairly common, um, you know, great plants. So yeah, there are a lot of people have them and, and that's actually a, a good way to get started, I think, is to identify the plants that you do have. Um, we also have a lot of plants that are really common that are non-native, um, you know, that people love. They're iconic, like the crepe myrtle and um, uh, many others, yews and cherry laurels and, you know, all the foundation plants that are have been um, planted. And I think, you know, if you have a, an iconic plant, you know, if you love crepe myrtles, by all means, you have a crepe myrtle, but you might want to think about adding a native plant and start layering in some native plants. And, um, you know, if you can start with trees because they provide the greatest ecological benefit. Um, but if you can't put in an oak, which is one of the most ecologically valuable species around, you know, maybe you can put in a smaller tree like a service berry or a dogwood. Um, and if not that, then some perennials. And, you know, if you can if you can do all and add some shrubs in, you can really layer in and have a very lively native garden along with the ornamental plants that you, that, that are special to you. Hmm. I'm so glad to hear you say that you don't just have to rip all those imported exotics out and switch over tomorrow. No, that just seems, that would, that seems impractical for most people, you know, and um, I, I think it, the, the, way, the place to start is, you know, we always start with the principle of do no harm, you know, in, in many facets of life. So um, I would suggest if you have some of the really prevalent invasive plants that you do try to remove those. And, you know, the ubiquitous ones around our area are, for example, the English ivy and the vinca, um, which I understand why people like those, you know, they're evergreen, they're easy care, but they are, they are invasive. Um, Barberries, Nandina, I mean, you can Google invasive species for our area and identify those. So some of those more detrimental plants, you might, you, you, I I would recommend starting with removing those. And, but the good news is there, there are lots of, of substitutes to replace those. Um, but no, if you have plants you like and they're not invasive, you, you should keep them and, and think about layering in um, where you can uh, native plants. So. Mm-hmm. And the most difficult, I think, garden to transplant to natives would be edible gardening. So so many of our edible plants are either from Central and South America or from Europe or Asia. So very few native plants are plants that you'd 
or edible native plants that you'd want to have in your garden. True, true. Although blueberries, I, I like to, to suggest those if you're if you want to add uh, native plants to your vegetable garden, uh, blueberries are great. Although I personally, and you might have advice on this, Kathy, I have planted a lot of blueberries. Uh, the birds love them. We get very few blueberries, but you know, it turns out that they're actually um, a fairly nice uh, shrub layer to have in your garden because they've got you know the the white flowers in the spring and of course the the blueberries for as long as they last and uh, the birds are pretty quick to get them. But then the red foliage in the fall is really striking. I mean, it's pretty nice. So. Um, they're, they're a plant that can go vegetable garden or landscape, I think. Um, I, I'm also trying uh, for the first time um, the native persimmon. And I so this is only my second year with it. So I don't know how that's going to go. We had three persimmons last spring. And uh, so I don't know if you have experience with that. I would say for the, the native persimmon, um, is difficult if you have any deer pressure because deer and squirrels and even the raccoons love to strip those persimmon off or, or take them even before they're ripe. And as many people know with the native persimmon versus the Asian that you will not want to take a bite of it until it is fully, fully, fully ripe because it is very sour um, when it's not ripe. So it's a matter of, I guess, keeping a close eye on those persimmon fruits, um, and making sure that deer are locked out of your garden. Um, as far as the blueberries and birds is kind of one of those situations of plant enough to share and they, and maybe you'll get a handful, uh, because I don't recommend netting, uh, blueberry bushes because of course birds and snakes and other creatures do get caught in those nets and uh, sometimes they'll strangle themselves before you even realize that they're caught in there. Yeah, good advice. But that's tough and and sometimes with edibles you just have to say well laissez-faire if I get some I get some <laughs> and, and hopefully you, you can plant several and the ones that are up top go for the birds. The ones maybe down below are yours. That sounds fair enough, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. And I was going to circle back to some, just to say for some of our listeners, the Heckingers that uh, Sherry referred to earlier uh, is was a local hardware store chain, uh, locally owned, family owned that preceded Home Depot and Lowe's and all those other big box stores. And I think some people, a lot of people still have some Heckinger price tags in their garden sheds. <laughs> I still have a couple tools of my own that have a Heckinger's price tag on there. Yes. Um, so so I, I believe if I recall correctly, they closed in the 80s, um, but it was a staple uh, uh, across the, uh, the region for sure. So one thing I wanted to bring up when you mentioned invasives is some of the terminology around native plants. Um, I'll hear somebody refer to, say, maypop, um, which is a native vine, and that can go insane in your garden and take over. And they'll say, don't plant that. Um, that's passion flower is another common name for it uh, because it's invasive. But um, technically, a native cannot be invasive, correct? Well, some natives are aggressive growers, uh, and maypop certainly is. I'm experiencing that right now, and uh, I would encourage. It's a it's a wonderful vine, and uh, it has a lot of great attributes, um, including these fascinating flowers as well as the fruit, which um, you can actually pop it if you step on it. It makes a popping sound. And if you're trying to get uh, kids engaged in gardening, it's it's a wonderful plant. But it, I, I would recommend if you're going to try it to start with it in a container and be very vigilant about watching where it goes because it will really spread quickly. Um, I think when we're talking about native plants, I, the, generally what we're, we're trying to encourage is planting uh, plants that are native here because our insects, our pollinators, our butterflies, and ultimately birds uh, use those plants uh, to reproduce and, and to thrive. And so 
while non-native plants provide nectar and pollen and, and certainly a nesting place for, for birds, uh, you, they don't support the full life cycle of, um, of our native uh, insect population, which is so critical ecologically. And so you, you want to provide the plants so that those insects and pollinators and butterflies and can reproduce and, and their larvae or the caterpillars, you know, eat the leaves of the native plants, um, where they will not eat the leaves of the non-native plants. So that's really the, the whole, um, the the gist behind using native plants versus non-native plants but just there's a whole range of native plants and and like you're saying Kathy the ones that are aggressive growers you you really want to be careful um, about those another great example of that is Virginia creeper um, so that's a, a vine many people know it and um, you know it has a lot of attributes ecologically um, you know it has uh, berries for birds right about now, the green berries are developing. And then of course, in the fall, it has beautiful, brilliant red and orange foliage. Um, but that is a plant to plant only if you are an avid gardener and you're going to be spending a lot of time pruning it and managing it. Um, or if you have an area, you know, if you, you garden in a, in a large space and you, you just want to let it run wild, you know, you, you can, but it's an aggressive grower. So Maypop and Virginia creeper, though, just because it's native doesn't mean it's going to be suited to your garden. And, um, you know, I garden on an eighth of an acre and I do have Virginia creeper trained along a very long fence but that's because I'm crazy about gardening and I'm willing to prune it really pretty much every other week to keep it in control. So um, you, you bring up a good point. Just because it's native doesn't mean you want it in your garden. So that's uh, it's it's good to check check out the attributes of the plants um, bef before you plant. And I, that's definitely the principle of right plant, right place. So just because it's listed as a native, even in our region, maybe even say in your zip code, that doesn't mean your microclimate of your back garden, say, is perfect for that plant. So true. So true. And so, you know, what would a native vine, since we're talking about vines, a great one, I'd like to encourage people uh, to to plant is native honeysuckle, um, uh, Lonicera sempervirens. It, it has the uh, beautiful coral colored um, tubular flowers and it, it will grow and cover, you know, a fence or if you have an unsightly utility pole, it can be great for that. And it grows, but it, it's manageable and it's not going to be crazily um, self-sowing and vining and twining like the other two we talked about do. And, and it's terrific for hummingbirds. In fact, that's one of the plants I like, I encourage my uh, friends who say, all right, I want to get encouraged, you know, I want to get started with native plants. What should I plant? Um, th that to me is a great one to start with, um, the honeysuckle vine. Hmm. Are there other beginning native plants that you would recommend for say a first time gardener or first time homeowner? Yes. Um, so, you know, in springtime, uh, we have a, a native poppy, the celandine poppy, which is a bright yellow flower. And particularly when that is uh, planted near Virginia bluebells, which I think a lot of people are familiar with, it is just a very lovely spring kind of scene. And um, both of those, I think, are fairly easy to to grow and the celandine poppy actually will self sow, but not in a crazy way. So, you know, if, you, if it self seeds somewhere else you can either move it or, or pull it up, it's really easy to do. But that combination of yellow and blue in early spring, it's great for um, shady or part shade areas. I, I, I encourage people to start with that, start the year off right with your native plants, you know, and you can plant those this fall for next spring, for example. Um, for the summer months, I, I, I like where we are now. I think um, anise hyssop, or a lot of people know it as agastache, that is a great plant because it it attracts so many pollinators. It's drought tolerant. It's easy to grow. 
sun, part shade. Um, I think it's another great plant for kids because it, it, the, it has a, a sort of a lavender blue wand flower and each wand has many, many small flowers on it. So the pollinators and often birds will, you know, they'll go from flower to flower. So they're sort of in one spot so you can really see them. Uh, so that's a great one. Also, um, another one that I really like, and, you know, I'd really be interested in your thoughts, uh, are, is the Hookera Autumn Bride. That is um, a, an ever, uh, excuse me, a semi-evergreen perennial. Um, and in a lot of areas, you know, it'll come, come up um, in early April with a really fresh green color. But to me, the one of its strongest attributes is, you know, na- in late July and August when you know, it's very hot and not a ton is blooming. You get these very sort of ethereal white wands of uh, small white blooms and it, it grows in shade, uh, deep shade or part shade. Uh, it's a little tough in, in sun. Uh, it'll, it'll crisp up, but it's really easy to grow. Um, it seems to me to be fairly drought tolerant. And, uh, uh, so I think that's another great plant to start with uh, for the partly shaded or shady areas if you're just getting started. And then in fall, you know, the the asters are, you know, there there's so many to choose from and, and they're easy to grow. Um, so, yeah, th- those are the ones I like to tell people to if they're thinking about it, you know, think about starting with those. Um, yeah, I would say that hookara, especially autumn bride, is a fabulous choice for beginning beginner it's basically no maintenance as long as you site it correctly with good drainage and i would say that's the key for that one is not letting it sit in a wet spot yes that's true and it'll kind of disappear and speaking of wet spots and the opposite anise hyssop has seeded into my driveway cracks for the last couple years um, and even in last year's prolonged drought that we had in late summer I never watered it, never did anything to it. And I, it was getting up to be about four or five feet wands at a certain point. It was just going crazy. So to the point that you think it's too aggressive? It's a little weedy, but I let it go. I was just like watching it in in amazement. (laughs) And then uh, it's, it was very shady actually part of the driveway too, which also amazed me because I always think of it more as a full sun type plant. Yeah, no, I think it can grow in shade and maybe maybe uh, a little more shade contains it a bit now that I think about it. Mm-hmm. And then the first two you, ref- you refer to, the um, Celandine poppy and the Virginia bluebells, just for our listeners who aren't familiar with uh, spring ephemerals, they'll come up and then they pretty much disappear by, say, early June. So you'll want to think about a succession of plants to replace them. So as maybe the Virginia bluebell foliage is dying back, you might have um, some other things coming in at the same time. Are there any combination plants that you recommend for those? Well, uh, so I have, yes, um, we already talked about the Hookera Autumn Bride and and that's one. Also, uh, there are a number of ferns that, you know, ferns look so delicate, but some of the native ferns are, are really fairly robust, I think. You know, Christmas fern is one, and, and that's one that's often described as uh, semi-evergreen. Uh, you know, it, it, it holds its shape for quite a long time, and it can, t- uh, it can take, you know, a little bit of dry conditions. I, I don't know that I would, it's not going to be evergreen all year round, certainly. You know, it lies flat in the in the depths of winter. But Christmas fern is a good one. Ostrich fern also, those those are nice. And particularly if you're in a, um, again, like we were saying, a part shade or, or shaded area, those, those are nice. Um, uh, black-eyed Susans, which I know are very common, and some people will tell me that they are, uh, they, they tire of black-eyed Susans, but but they are really great flowers for, for or perennials to use for many reasons. Um, they are uh, drought tolerant. Uh, they provide, uh, they're very popular with both pollinators and, and birds. And if you leave the seed heads up in the fall, 
uh, you can help feed birds through the the fall and the winter. And also, you know, this is sort of an aesthetic and you have to decide what's for you and what's not for you. But leaving those seed heads up rather than cleaning your garden up in the fall, um, you know, is really beneficial ecologically. And uh, it, to me, it provides a nice layer of winter interest, you know, when, when there's not a lot else happening. So black-eyed Susans can be interplanted with these and, and you, those will take full sun, of course, but they'll also do fine in, in part shade, I, I think also. Yeah, definitely. I've had black eyed Susans reseed themselves into what I considered almost full shade spots and still bloom. Um, so it just tells you it's a very versatile workhorse plant. Yes. Yes. And great for backgrounds. And I'm glad you brought up the uh, leaving the seed heads because as a, I'm going to call myself a lazy gardener, especially at towards the end of the season where I'm just overwhelmed with other tasks to do. The last thing I'm going to be doing um, is cutting back perennials because I like the look of the seed heads. And of course, we collect a lot of the seeds for our annual seed exchanges that we host. Um, but I'm so glad to have learned the, the latest research of in the last few years that our native bees and beetles actually overwinter in the tubes of the um, flower spikes from a lot of our native plants. So they're not necessarily benefiting from the seed head itself, but the fact that you left up the flower stalk um, gives them a place to winter over. Yes. And, you know, we're, we learn so much, you know, it seems year by year. And, and likewise, if you can leave a little bit of the a leaf litter, the dead leaves on the ground, not only will that, you know, ultimately um, help build your soil and improve your soil, but that's also a place where a lot of uh, insects and, um, and, uh, pollinators will overwinter. And, and so it's important uh, to do that if you can. And, you know, going back to um, making it easy to, to, to garden with native plants, um, there are a lot of things that people who aren't avid gardeners have do because that's what they've been taught to do. And so um, I, I think that um, all the work that you're doing and all of your, your podcasts and your, you can grow that and your Washington, uh, gardener magazine is such a great resource to have here because you're keeping up on top of all that information. And, um, so for example, the notion of sort of cleaning up the fall garden where you swoop in and gather everything up and, and, you know, break up all the leaves. Um, you know, we now know that that, is is not good for for the for our gardens or for the larger landscape and so everybody has to make their own decisions what they want to do and what they can live with i have friends who will they will still cut down their perennials but they will then leave the stalks on the ground so that just as you say kathy the the insects can can use those tubes so you know anything you can do helps and um uh i I do think it's a, it, you know, gardeners, uh, even, you know, someone like me, I'm gardening on an eighth of an acre in a very urban area. Every little bit helps, you know, to uh, create um, sort of corridors or, or um, we're stringing together uh, areas that are, are providing what insects and birds need. And, um, you know, I always like to say, you know, Maryland is a small state, right? Six million acres, two million of it is uh, developed, two million approximately is in agriculture, and two million remains forested. Well, that, that means we've taken two thirds of it and changed the natural landscape. So um, there's a lot of thinking now that um, in order to uh, restore some of the greater ecological function that we're losing, that if each of us gardeners, no matter how small a, a place you garden in, if, if we can help toward that, uh, that's what will really make the difference in the long run. So yeah, there's a lot to do. And um, fortunately, gardening with native plants is a lot of fun because you, you do get a lot of activity in your garden along with it. 
Mm -hmm. And one point we we need to make about leaving those seed heads up is that some of them will actually reseed themselves about like the anise hyssop I had referred to earlier. Um, So you can encourage that in certain ways uh, by, again, leaving the leaf litter around not being so tidy in the fall so that you buy, say, three to five lobelia cardinal flower plants and by spreading the seed around, maybe helping it a little bit um, in some areas that you think might look good with cardinal flower in your garden, uh, you can actually multiply those plants over the coming years. Yes. And what gardener doesn't love free plants? Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> And some plants more... Uh, prolific than others. <laughs> There's always the heartbreaking ones that you're like, I wish this one would multiply and you you try over and over again. And then there's the other ones that you're like, Ugh. like the black eyed Susan we referred to earlier because it, it is so prolific and spreads um, itself out, not just by seed, but underground stolen. So there's always black eyed Susans to share. Yes. And, you know, they make a great cut flower. So to me, too many black eyed Susans isn't a bad thing. Uh, too many uh, May Pops or Passion Flowers or Virginia Creeper can be a bad thing. So, uh, yeah, you just have to pick and pick the right plant for your garden, like you say. Mm hmm. And I was going to ask you about unusual natives, those natives where you just said to yourself one day when you were reading or researching, that's a native. So for me, that was anything that's in the magnolia family and the pawpaw trees. I was just, they look so tropical and almost out of place to me in the, in the eastern forest setting that I'm always surprised when I have to remind myself, nope, this isn't an Asian plant. This is a native. You know, that is really true. And um, pawpaws in you know, particular, they, they have that banana-like fruit and they, well, banana-like in, the, in, in terms of the, the taste, not the, the shape of the fruit. Uh, but that is really true. Um, magnolias are another. Let me think for a minute. Um, you know, I, it all, it, some of the, the roses, the swamp rose, um, the Rose of Virginiana, you know, they, they remind me of beach roses, um, but I, I'm all, always surprised that those are, are native to this area. But it's not, uh, that's probably not a great answer to your question because it, it's not that unusual. Um, I don't know. Maybe... The, Go ahead. I was going to just say, how about the native hibiscus? That's something that's coming into bloom around this time yeah, in the summer. That's a perfect answer to your question. Uh, yeah, those are the 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 mallows that have these enormous uh, hi- hibiscus looking blooms. And um, that's interesting because of course I grew up in South Florida where hibiscus are, you, you know, they're everywhere. Um, but I was actually surprised to learn that that was a native flower and they have the, you know, they, there are the deep reddish maroon flowers and the very sort of candy pink uh, blooms as well. And, and they do look at, they, yeah, that's surprising that they're native, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one of the ones that they're so huge and such a dinner plate sized single flowers that you're like, somebody along the way had to breed these for this purpose. But nope, that's what Mother Nature did. Yep, it's it's pretty interesting. And, and you know, and actually that brings up an interesting point, Kathy. You know, it's almost as if for every of uh, every ornamental plant, the ones that are not native to our area, you know, you can not a hundred percent, but I'd say 85% of the time, you can find a native plant that makes a good substitute. Um, You know, it might not be the perfect substitute, but you can find the flower color, or you can find that shape or texture that you want for your, for your garden. So there are, you know, there, the, the range of natives is, I think, broader than a lot of people think. And um, that's why I'm so encouraged that, you know, in our area, we have um, a number of nurseries now that are specializing in native plants only. And so if this is something that's of interest to you, I really encourage people to go to one of those nurseries, because like you say, Kathy, you'll be like, wow, you know, I did not know that that was native. And, and, and you'll find, you know, inevitably something that that's of interest to you, I think. 
Mm -hmm. And there's also the local public gardens in our area that will have either a dedicated garden section for native gardens um, or they will have it well labeled that they might have the Asian fringe tree right near a native fringe tree so you can make that comparison. Yes. And, you know, like we're lucky to have Washington Gardener magazine and all the associated media uh, here, we are also really fortunate to have so many incredible uh, gardens. Um, and one of my favorites is Mount Cuba, which is, of course, in Delaware, not right here in Washington, D.C., but that's an interesting place uh, in so much as, uh, for those who don't know it, it's, an, it's a, a very formal home that was built in the early 1900s and now is dedicated to growing native plants. But they have demonstration gardens that um, go from the very traditional around the main house, uh, you know, the most traditional of plantings, but using native plants. And then, of course, they have woodlands and pond settings and meadow-like settings. So you can really see the entire spectrum. And then closer to home, and I know you're more familiar on the Virginia side than I am, but you know we've got the U.S. Botanical Garden and all the Smithsonian Gardens, which have added a, a tremendous number of native plants and demonstration gardens um, throughout the Smithsonian properties downtown. And yeah, there are a lot of, a lot of places around. To, um, we're very fortunate in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Meadowlark Botanical Gardens in Vienna, Virginia has a really nice uh, native woodland walk that, especially on a hot, sunny day like today, that's a perfect place because it's a very deep shaded walk. That sounds like a plan for the weekend, Kathy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get, get away from, and there's a nearby large pond. So if you like to sit in a couple Adirondack chairs and just watch the dragonflies on the cattails, that's a really picturesque spot to be. That sounds pretty good right about now. And we're in our, what, third week of 90 plus temperatures. Yes, uh, I think besides the humans, the plants are looking for some relief too, um, which brings us to some of the native maintenance. So if you were to say introduce a native plant to your garden that was originally um, a wetlands plant, then that would take extra water. So I think there's a lot of misinformation out there on native plants that they are drought all drought tolerant and that they all don't need extra watering. Um, uh, what informa misinformation are you encountering? Well, that is a really good point. And that's, uh, I, I think over the past 20 years, it, you know, you often saw, well, plant native, they're drought tolerant. And, and just as, as you so well know, uh, there's no plant that, that doesn't need to be watered to get established. Right. So any plant that you plant needs regular watering to get it established. And um, it is still important, just like any other plant you would plant, to look at the, the conditions that it needs. Um, so uh, if, you know, you mentioned lobelia and some of the irises, um, there are a lot of native plants that are available, but they, they demand moist conditions. So if if you can't provide that, it, it, they're not gonna, gonna, going to work. Um, on, the, on the plus side, there are a fair number of native plants that actually can do fairly well in our, our clay soils, um, you know, which is, can be a challenge. So it, it's just like gardening in general. You have to, as you said earlier, get the right plant for the, for the right place. And um, yeah, so I, I think that there are a lot of advantages to native plants, but the notion that somehow they don't need to be watered, you know, there are some like that, <laughs> the Aristachi apparently <laughs> that you, that you have had experience with. Um, and, but by and large, you, you have to pay attention to all the usual things that w one does when you plant a plant. Mm -hmm. I think, and I think the point would be you're taking it from its native spot, wherever that might be, and putting it in probably some harsh urban conditions. Um, your soil could be compacted. You might be exposed to air pollution or just the urban heat island um, could make your little garden microclimate a little more hostile than what it normally would be in. Yes. Yes. Very good point. I know one of the 
plants that a lot of gardeners struggle with that they wish they could have more luck with in the native department are trilliums. Are you growing any trillium? Yes. Um, and, you know, I have the, the red trillium and the, and the yellow and uh, they, they do need, uh, I think, moisture conditions and, you know, a, a nice soil. So, you know, you can't just plop those down anywhere. They need very specific conditions. How about you? Are you having any luck with those? I do have a few planted right around an old bird bath um, that I turned into a planter. So they get watered when the planter gets watered on top, that container. So I find that to help because I have a lot of dry shade under old growth oak trees. Yes. Um, so under oak trees is, is a, it's a challenge. Um, uh, so if you, if you've got trillium growing there, I think you're doing well. I, um, you know, that's actually one of the, the things I've been looking at recently is what will grow well underneath an oak tree. And um, so I, I'm trying out uh, Pennsylvania sedge, uh, which is supposed to be ideal for that. It's a very fine textured grass. And, you know, if you get it in the right spot, it creates sort of um, waves of grass. And so I'm giving that a try and, and we'll see how that goes. And and that's actually out on the uh, hell strip, what most people call a hell strip. Although I was recently uh, corrected by a young nephew from Ohio. Uh, he told me that there they call it the tree lawn. And I <laughs> thought, well, that's a lot, sounds a lot nicer than, than, than the health trip. So I'm trying to adopt that, the tree lawn. Um, so I'm trying it there and so far so good. I, you know, I planted, uh, uh, early spring and, and, you know, there, it's been very dry as we were talking about here and, and, and it's doing well. Um, yeah. So, uh, but the trilliums are beautiful and the, you know, the modeled text, uh, the modeled coloring of the leaves and, you know, they're, they're very architectural plants. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned before, if you do take a trip up to Mount Cuba, um, say towards the end of April, you will see uh, hundreds and hundreds of beautiful trillium. And, and those are not low maintenance plants. Don't let the native uh, label fool you. Yes. I think you make a really good point. Just, just because it's native doesn't mean it's low maintenance. Um, well, we've talked about that, but mm -hmm. And so let's circle back to our trip last year to Denver with the Garden Bloggers Fling. So that's a, a loose group of about 80 to 100 garden bloggers who meet annually um, and talk about our blogs. And of course, some people are doing it professionally, some of it as just a side hobby and exploring all the gardens we can see in one jam-packed long weekend. Yes, it was, you know, as we started with saying, uh, the the gardening that goes on there in those uh, arid conditions is really remarkable. And there, I thought there was a, uh, because of the water situation there, um, two things struck me. Uh, there, they, there is a, a big focus on native plants or, or xeriscaping because of the, of the dry conditions they have there. And then from sort of the other side of it, I was really surprised and uh, remark, I thought it was remarkable the number of gardens that are on, you know, full drip systems to make sure that uh, you're using water as wisely as possible. And um, it, it, it's an interesting concept out there. I mean, they just don't, some of those gardens, they, they just, you, every plant is, you know, on a, on a soaker drip system. And, uh, um, you know, I don't think we have that aesthetic or ethic here. Uh, but it, it was interesting to see it and how effective it is and how water conscious, uh, that is, as opposed to, you know, standing over a garden bed with a hose or using a sprinkler. Those are enormously inefficient, um, from a watering perspective. Yeah, and I think it's because we're seasonal, that usually we have a, a wet enough winter, a, wet, a pretty wet spring, and into early summer, and then we're entering our dry period now. So people don't feel like you need year-round irrigation um, versus the dry um, altitude gardens and arid gardens in Denver. Yes. 
Yeah. And I was amazed at some of the native plants I saw out there that, you know, there was, they might be the Western counterpoints to our Eastern natives like Columbine in particular, that they have such a bigger vocabulary or variety than what we have in the Eastern um, choices. Yes. Uh, you know, these, and the size of the Columbine flowers was really stunning too. Um, uh, and the, as you say, the color variation from pink to purple to yellow. Um, uh, and I'm glad you brought up, brought up Columbine. Uh, the, the, the native Columbine for our area, of course, is the Eastern Columbine and Aquilegia canadensis. And I'm not sure if my pronunciation is, is, is good. Uh, but it's a very small red and yellow flower. Lovely. But you know, it's, it's small, it doesn't grow to the height and the size of the columbines out there. And, and then, as you say, there, there are a lot of um, natives, and you can see the similarities. um, But I think with the intensity of the sun and the arid conditions, you know, the, the natives, in some, in some ways are more uh, uh, robust or spectacular. but that, you know, that's a, yet another reason to think about using native plants in your garden, right? You wouldn't, uh, you know, we wouldn't want every garden across the country to look the same. Um, so if you're looking to make your garden unique, I think, um, you can do that with non-native plants. But because we have so few native plants, um, relatively speaking, to or- compared to ornamentals, um, typically in our gardens in this area, you can, you can add some unique features to your garden by using native plants. Mm-hmm. And I will say that I also admire the Denver gardeners themselves, because after three to four days of touring, I was ready to be planted in a pool myself. They are they are uh, hardy people, let's say that, uh, dedicated and very artistic, a lot of artistic uh, touches and artistry in those gardens also. Mm-hmm. And wonderful. And so I was going to ask you to share your website na- address for our listeners. Sure. It's nutsfornatives.com. And uh, it provides information um about where to buy native plants. And it, there uh, is a list of ornamental plants that you may be familiar with. And if you want to check out a native substitute, um, there's some suggestions there. And then there are some tools uh, that uh, every gardener needs, uh, including uh, a finder uh, that is available from the National Wildlife Federation. You can enter your zip code and find uh, native plants for your code. Uh, and, and lots of other. Great. I also wanted to mention, if I can, Kathy, uh, there are a couple of nurseries. Uh, if people want to see what's available uh, in the native plant world, you, of course, can go to your local garden center. And I think most of the large garden centers uh, have native plants, like you said, either a section or they're labeled as you know, good for Virginia, good for Maryland. Uh, But there are a couple of nurseries that are really, if you really want to check out native plants, um, Nature by Design in Alexandria and um, the Herring Run Nursery in Baltimore. And then in Northern Maryland, there's a place called Kolar Nursery, which if people haven't been, just the experience of going there is wonderful. It's just on the Maryland-Pennsylvania line and it's uh, a couple, the Kolars, and they have a dell down to a pond and they have every manner of native plant from very small to mature sizes. And it, it's really a fun place to go. And then another place that I really think is such a great resource for us, Kathy, and I know you know it is Azel Native Plants, which is an online uh, source for native plants. So there's a lot available out there um, if, if you're so inclined. Well, it's just a lot of fun. So, uh, you know, if you start with one or, or 10, I'm sure you'll be delighted. And uh, the more native plants you have, the more active your garden will be, meaning more bees, pollinators, and birds. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, that's, that's pretty much what it's all about. So I hope everybody has a, a good uh, 
gardening experience out there. And Kathy, again, thank you for everything you do for us, the gardening community in this area. We, we are very fortunate. Plant Profile, Sunflowers. Sunflowers are an annual flowering plant and are a great garden choice for supporting pollinators and wildlife. You will need a sunny spot to grow them in. They don't call them sunflowers for nothing. They are not picky about soils, but make sure it is well draining as they do not like wet feet. Seed them about six inches apart, either in clumps of three or in rows. You can start them indoors and plant them out after the last frost, though they are just as easy to direct sow. Keep your seedlings well watered. They will grow fast and a touch of liquid fertilizer will help them get quick energy. Once established, they do not need much watering unless it has not rained in your area for a few weeks. Most sunflowers do not need staking. If you plant them where they get constant wind or lean out from shade into the sun, then you might want to tie them with soft cloth strips to a sturdy rod of rebar or metal stake. Sunflowers make great trellises for edible climbing plants like beans or ornamental annual vines. You can also use tall sunflowers to create an almost instant fence and shade around a portion of your garden. There are an amazing variety of sunflowers available in seed catalogs. You can choose from knee-high to gargantuan. Some produce huge heads full of nutritious seeds, while others are teddy bear style, covered in fuzzy petals and are practically sterile. Then there are the color choices. Classic yellow is always in fashion, but don't stop there. Check out the chocolate hues, deep reds, and buttery creams. Sunflowers make a terrific cup flower. One caution though, you want to put them in a bottom heavy container so that when they turn to face the sun, they don't topple down the vase with them. Leave up your sunflower heads at the end of the season to allow the wildlife to enjoy the seeds and the extra spilled on the ground will grow for you next year. You can also cut the flower heads and hang them to dry and harvest them for seeds to share with other gardeners. Once you are ready to take down your plants, you may find the stalks to be quite strong and fibrous. Chop them up before adding them to your compost pile. Sunflowers, you can grow that. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter by going to anchor.fm backslash Kathy dash gents backslash support for as little as 99 cents a month. You can become a listener supporter and we'll give you a shout out in a future episode. Another way to support garden DC is to go to washingtongardener.com and subscribe to Washington Gardener magazine. Diversity, equity, and inclusion. I have been giving a lot of thought lately to the concepts of diversity, equity, and inclusion in the garden, and how these lessons can be applied to society as a whole. Over the last century or so, we have seen time and time again how planting monoculture communities of one species has proven disastrous, from the rapid decline of the American elm to the Victoria oat blight. When one species is used extensively, it is perfectly set up for a sudden demise. Sure, it's simpler and much easier to tend field after field and front lawn after front lawn of one plant type, but that's not how nature works. As Michael Pollan wrote, a field of identical plants will be exquisitely vulnerable to insects, weeds, and disease. The latest horticultural research shows that, in fact, the ideal planting communities are those that are matrixes of overlapping plant varieties. The matrix model includes plants that interweave and occupy different spaces across multiple growing seasons. It helps to think of them as a successive wave of peaks and valleys. As some plants hit their stride and bloom, others are just emerging, while still others are going to seed and creating a living mulch. Each has their own time to shine. This can be a very complex operation. 
one plant can easily take the fore and run roughshod over other planting communities in its exuberance. This requires constant vigilance and selective editing on the behalf of the gardener to ensure each plant has its own growing space and an opportunity to succeed. It's not always easy, and there are hard decisions to be made. We want all of our plants to be their best at all times, but that may not be entirely possible with limited resources. So which ones get the beneficial extra water, mulching, and fertilizer? It's the ones who we pay attention to out of proximity and habit. They're the plants we remember from previous seasons and are familiar with their care. The other plants cannot speak up and say, look after me, if we never stop and listen to them. Not to lay it on too thick here, but I believe this matrix model of plantings can teach us a great deal about interacting with our fellow human beings. Before I share what's blooming in the garden this week, I wanted to thank our latest listener supporter, Ann Kovalt. Thanks so much, Ann. The one bloom I was so happy to see this week in my garden was the Purple Pillar Rose of Sharon. It is a double color with a deep magenta center and purple outer petals. I just love it. And the best thing about it, besides its columnar tall, thin habit, is that it is sterile. So I've been trialing it for a few years in a large container and keeping a close eye on it to make sure it is in fact sterile in my garden. Another bloom I'm happy to see pop popping up all over is the reseeding blackberry lily, which is in its little orange orchid stage right now. Otherwise, the foliage kind of disappears and looks like an iris. The next blooms that I wanted to share with you all are some Sygenta flowers that I'm trialing. Uh, most of them are annuals, and I have fallen in love with the Zonal Geranium Ivy League series. Um, the specific one that I just adore right now is called Cherry Blossom. It's got a white flower with pink edging, really strong blooming habit and stays compact. And I have that in a front container that is just looking magnificent right now. The other one that I just adore that I have by a backdoor container is Tradewinds Osteospermin. And this is a bright, bold, daisy-like flower. It kind of has a pink inner circle to each petal and then goes to orange and then a yellow outer petal. So the sunset name that this one has is No Misnomer. The rest of the plants they sent me to trial are petunias, and there's the Itsy Magenta and the Deco Banana, both of which are blooming in this high heat we're having right now in the DC area. And I have not given them extra fertilizer, but I have been watering them as much as I can. And once I finish this recording, I'm gonna go out there and throw some more water on there. Hopefully we get some rain soon and happy gardening. You can find Washington Gardener online at washingtongardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.